Welcome to the Dr. Mead Show. One of the things I do most commonly all day long is address patient's fear and misinformation in orthopedics. So I thought I could dedicate an entire show to assuaging the fears of patients <clears throat> and reviewing some of the misinformation and dispelling those fears. So part of my agenda today is, is to really review um, the fear of knee injections. You can't believe how many people fear knee injections. I'm going to go over manipulation under anesthesia, explain what that is. I'm going to review physical therapy after total knee replacement. Is it necessary? Do you need narcotics? Can you do a total knee replacement without opioid narcotics? First of all, let's talk about aspiration and knee injections. So, Many of the patients I see in a knee practice have a swollen knee, and that means that the knee is filled with fluid, either synovial fluid, inflammatory fluid, or even blood. So to afford that patient some relief, we have to take the fluid out. That's called aspiration. And to do that, we have to put a needle in a knee. Now, <clears throat> once I walk in the room and we talk about aspirating a knee, the patient hears nothing else. Many of them turn white. They see the needle come in the room and they are scared. And why are they scared? It's not because that's their first experience, but they have to dig deep in their memory. And somewhere in the past, they've had a problem. They've had a bad experience with getting a joint injected. They had a swollen knee and it taints them for the rest of their life. And aspirating a knee is, is not easy. You have to really understand the surface anatomy. So when patients come in and said, oh no, Dr. Mead, I've had this before. I went to the emergency room or I, I hurt my knee in high school and it was a terrible experience. And I said, well, this is a whole lot different, but it takes me as long to explain and calm the patient down. But our technique is, is very, reproducible, and it's actually very simple once we talk the patient to it. But again, every knee is not the same. As orthopedic surgeons, we have to understand the anatomy. The key to taking fluid out of a knee is the kneecap. Not every kneecap is exactly the same anatomically. If it has arthritis and bone spurs, you can't go in the same place. You have to understand how to do that. And people will explain, oh, Dr. Mead, somebody had that knee and they were poking it around and it was torture. So this is what I have to deal with. So what I thought I would do is just recently I had a patient that had a swollen knee and I'll show you the video of what exactly we do to assuage the fears of people that might have a swollen knee and they need some relief. I have Robert Goloszewski here who has a swollen knee. He's doing a lot of work at home going up and down stairs, has some underlying arthritis and occasionally you'll get a knee effusion and to resolve that, you have to take the fluid out and inject it with a steroid. A lot of people are hesitant. They've heard horror stories about that. So I wanted to demonstrate our technique for you. So the first thing I do is palpate the surface anatomy and, he, and it bulge, the fluid bulges out on the lateral aspect. So we know there's probably 30 or 40 cc's of fluid. So the first thing we do is squirt the skin here just to provide some superficial analgesia. So use an alcohol swab. And again, the surface anatomy is critical to know where you're going in. There's not many nerve fibers right here in the skin. So what we do is with a very small gauge needle, we'll put a pinch of lidocaine or novocaine right there at the skin. And um, just go nice and easy. And Robert is great. And that just numbs up the skin so we don't feel the next one. And then Aaron can pan up just to show how comfortable Rob is there. And we, on the way out, we just kind of mark where that was, wipe off the little alcohol swab. And the needle is so small that you can hardly see where we went in, but you just get the patient to relax and we love to see just one red blood cell. And that allows us to put the aspiration needle, which always looks a little bigger, but we go in the exact same spot 
So the skin is actually numb right there. So we may feel a little tiny pressure, but we just take our time. And there's always a second pop like a balloon and boom, we're in the knee. And that's all there is to it. And then we just draw back and you could see the serous fluid, that's normal synovial fluid coming out. There's no discomfort to the patient. If you talk them through it, so there's no reason that patients should be fearful of ever needing their knee aspirated if they use this technique. And as you can see, this will afford Robert a lot of pain relief because that amount of synovial fluid is just pressure in the knee. So we're just aspirating that synovial fluid. I palpate just to push any little fluid out and, and that's it. Now, if I wanna put steroid in, I just change the syringe. I don't have to stick him again. He's very comfortable as Aaron can pan up and see. And then we know we're in the joint. There's absolutely no resistance. And, and Bob, do you feel pressure at all? No. And so that's it. We're all done. I want to thank him for demonstrating how the knee can be painlessly aspirated. And hopefully that assuages the fears of other people who will no longer be afraid to have their knee aspirated with this technique. Thank you. We do that 10, 20 times a day. He's, he never flinched. Um, but not every knee needs to be aspirated. So there are many knees that just need to be injected. And no matter what we're injecting, whether that's a steroid or one of the hyaluronic acid gel injections, it's all the same. People will cringe and say, oh my God, I got a cortisone injection and it was so painful. Cortisone hurts. Well, it doesn't matter what we're injecting. If you put it in the right place, it should not hurt. If it hurts, it's going in the wrong place. It's going in the, in the synovial lining, and that's a bad sign. So I wanted to show you <clears throat> what it's like to just inject the knee. We have the patient sit up because then gravity pulls the leg down. It distracts the knee, and this is the second technique if you need just a cortisone or a gel injection, and you don't need it aspirated. And again, this shouldn't cause perspiration to be running down the side of your face. You shouldn't turn white and pass out. This is an easy, easy injection. And this is what we teach all of our providers. Um, so let me show you what it's like to do a, a typical cortisone injection. I have Tom Strenchok here, long-term patient of mine, like many of my patients that are kind of in between um, early arthritis and advanced arthritis. He's not at the knee replacement stage, but many of the tools we use to keep people out of the operating room are anti-inflammatories, lifestyle changes, um, supplements, and injections, which can help for a long period of time. Many people fear injections for a lot of reasons. Nobody likes needles, they think they hurt, and indeed, a lot of people have had bad experiences and it taints them for life. So I wanted to show the technique that we use just to, just to demonstrate to people that it can be done very comfortably and it's not something they should be afraid of. So Melissa's gonna hand me some ethyl chloride. So we'll go through the normal steps. If you, you have to understand knee anatomy and surface anatomy. And the best place to inject the knee, in my opinion, is the lateral fat pad. There's very few superficial nerves there. So it's something that isn't uncomfortable. So I'm gonna spray that area with ethyl chloride which will provide some superficial analgesia. We have a sterile technique. We use a little alcohol swab, <clears throat> and we talk the patient through it. So again, I'm always palpating the surface anatomy so I know where to go. We use a very, very tiny needle, and we put a little bit of lidocaine, which is like Novocaine, and it's pretty simple right there. If you place it in the lateral fat pad, there's almost no reaction from the patient, we go nice and slow, and all this does is numb up the skin so it's not uncomfortable for the patient. We only stick them once, so then we remove the syringe and we go right to the depimetrol or the cortisone, and we reattach it to the needle, and then the key is nice and slow injection. So we know there's very little resistance. It's going right into the middle of the knee, exactly where we, know, where we need it. And if this can provide six to 12 months of relief, um, what a wonderful option for the patient. When this stops working, then we can talk about surgical options.
But that's it. And you can see if it's done correctly, understanding the surface anatomy, there's very little reason to fear. So Tom, I appreciate you being no my problem. example for patients that are fearful. I hope I can help. And they shouldn't be. Thank you very much. So a lot, a lot of patients <clears throat> have misunderstandings also about injections. How often can I get them? How many can I get in my lifetime? And they'll come in and they've had some information provided by neighbors, friends, even other providers. But there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so to answer the simple question, how long does a cortisone injection last? There is no correct answer. It depends on the pathology of the knee. The worse the knee is, the shorter it will last. If you have end-stage knee arthritis, it's not unusual for it to last a couple weeks. If you have early to moderate arthritis, it could last a year or more. How many injections can you get? There is no limit. Now, there are some good medical practices that we kind of abide by, but it's not absolute. So we try not to inject cortisone injections more than every three months, but it's not absolute. We're on, <clears throat> you know, two months and, and 29 days, you can't get it, or um, you know, right after three months, you can, you can get it. So I just wanna sort of mention that. So right now, I wanna move on to another fear, and that's what's called manipulation after uh, a total knee replacement, manipulation under anesthesia. So if you stick with me after the break, I will explain what manipulation under anesthesia is all about and it's not a failure on the patient's part. Folks, welcome back. I'm Dr. Mead, and our show today is about fear and misunderstanding in orthopedics. Before we get on to the next part of our show, I just wanna say that uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I work for Lehigh Valley Health Network, and uh, I work um, in Allentown, Lehighton, Hazleton, and the Wyoming Valley. We cover a big area, and we have patients not only from all over Pennsylvania, but from all over the country coming to us, um, and my specialty is knee surgery. So today, we just spoke about a lot of fears that patients have, and um, if you watch the first half of the show, it was on their fear of needles and uh, some misunderstandings uh, in orthopedics. And so now I wanna talk about um, well, let's call it a complication after knee surgery, whether it's an arthroscopic procedure, a sports procedure like an anterior cruciate ligament, or a bad knee sprain. Sometimes your knee gets stiff. And why does that happen? Well, because after surgery or after an injury, there's blood in the joint. And that blood and tissue trauma can cause scar tissue. And that causes pain. And if the knee doesn't move, and it's not unusual for patients to be a little bit afraid to move the knee afterwards, and everybody has a different pain threshold and there's a different degree of tissue trauma. But one of the most common procedures we do is a knee replacement, and that requires movement, and that movement is uncomfortable in the first couple weeks afterwards. Now, we like you to get your normal range of motion back, and normal range of motion can be 120, 130 degrees, and we would like to see that in a reasonable amount of time, let's say six weeks. Um, historically, we would work, we'd send you to therapy, and if you didn't have that motion, we would go for three or four months, and then we would say, boy, this is a tough knee. We may have to give you some sedation and do what's called a manipulation under anesthesia. And again, patients would turn white, they would feel like they're a failure, and a lot of times um, the therapist uses that to motivate them and says, well, if you don't work hard, you're gonna to have to be manipulated, but they take it as a threat and it's gonna be something painful. But I wanna show you that sometimes you can't help it. There's a genetic predisposition to scar tissue. And now we know after many, many years of doing joint replacement that the optimal time to evaluate the knee for that type of procedure is right around six weeks. So if you don't have the range of motion that we want and a functional range of motion to put your socks on put your shoes on, get up out of a low chair, then we will consider a manipulation under anesthesia. I actually call it an exam under anesthesia. And what I do is I took a video 
of the last patient, I did a manipulation under anesthesia and I show it to them and I show them how gentle it is. It's really not a violent procedure. It's really not that painful afterwards. We don't increase their pain medicine and they can go to therapy the next day. So let me just show you a video of what a manipulation or examination under anesthesia after a knee replacement looks like. So a small percent of people will have some scar tissue or like this patient, she had previous arthroscopy and they may be at a higher risk for having a stiff knee postoperatively. So right around six weeks seems to be the optimal time to give a little push. Some people think that, patients will think that manipulation is a very violent thing, but the way we do it is very gentle. So the first thing we do is I just hold it up like this and that just shows us that that's all she goes to 90 degrees. So then I will gently sit on the bed, I'll put my ear on the knee and I can actually hear the adhesions breaking and as you can see it really takes very little pressure and I just lean on it and it would be torture in six weeks of therapy to do this. So when we're done I just take another picture and you can see we probably have 130, 135 degrees range of motion all in less than 30 seconds avoiding therapy. Thus, that's our manipulation. I call it examination under anesthesia. Thank you. So that's a great little video. And the patient is sedated for 30 seconds, but they're not under general anesthesia. They don't have a tube down their, tr their throat. They are not paralyzed. And for what we could do in 30 seconds versus going to therapy um, for, like I said, six or eight weeks is really not the right answer. So I show them this video. And if it's necessary, you shouldn't be afraid of it. The percentages are probably somewhere between two and four percent of, of all total knee replacements may need a procedure like this. So let me move on and talk about really what we're doing these days. And this is a patient that I'll, I'll have him uh, relay his experience, but we'll cover a couple different topics. And what's the difference between resurfacing and um, replacing? Well, there's really no difference in my mind. Everything that we do is a resurfacing procedure. When we replace the hip or we replace the shoulder, we actually do replace the whole joint. In the knee, it's more, think of it more like a dental procedure. We're putting a crown on the end of the femur bone and we're putting a cap on the top of the tibia bone and a little plastic liner between them. And we no longer use cement in these knees like we did historically. They grow right onto the bone. Again, the analogy like a dental procedure. So when patients see this and we show them the model in the office, they, they sort of understand and they say, oh, I'll have that procedure. I thought you were taking my whole knee out and putting a whole knee in there. And then we go through the other um, advances in our procedure where half of our people never take a narcotic pain pill, which is absolutely amazing considering what we did historically. And no formal therapy in some patients. That doesn't mean no therapy. Therapy is very important, but we like them, we teach them. We have our therapists teach them ahead of time. And a week after, many of our patients do do formal therapy. So let me explain, or let me have Joe explain what he went through with both knee resurfacing procedures. I have Joe Kahuta here, who was a long-term patient of mine. And uh, he's a great example of uh, the value of uh, modern day knee replacement. I followed Joe for years. He has his own contracting business and he exhausted all non-operative options, anti-inflammatories. We would inject Joe, I don't know, every three months religiously. Isn't that right? That's right. For yeah. years, big swollen yeah. knees. Had problems, yeah. And so he was always balancing, making a living, working and getting these knees fixed despite you know, the side effects to his body with oral anti-inflammatories, injections, but he bit the bullet. And I don't blame him. You're sort of like jumping out of a plane without a parachute. That's for sure. Because you don't know the result. Yeah. You know what it feels like to hurt and swell, but you could function. Yep. I had constant pain and everything I did, it limited me. It limited. So we did one at a time during the pandemic. Um, rapid recovery, outpatient, total knee arthroplasty, and um, we did one at a time and uh, he bit the bullet and he did it. So a couple questions. Um, his concern was downtime. It's only really, Joe, you and another guy in your business. Yeah. He does all residential heavy labor contracting. So after the first knee, 
let me just fast forward and say, how long were you out of work? Under four weeks. <laughs> Under four weeks to get back to a heavy contracting. So we do a couple things. You went home the same day. Yep. Joe, right? Yep. You did our multimodal pain approach. We always give you some narcotics for breakthrough pain. And our therapy, um, we individualize that. And you, did you go to therapy or do it on your own? I did it all on my own. You did it all on your own. Yes. And so, how did that work I, out for you? I, I call work physical therapy. <laughs> yeah, so it you, worked out, I got all my mobility back. Straighten out your leg for me. Yes. Bend it back all the way for me, Joe. And that's his, that's his one name. Yeah. And uh, Both Melissa, you could scan his Both x-ray. Ours. The first one, you could see he's bone on bone on the medial compartment. And then uh, yeah. um, we'll, we'll look at the other one in a second. So then we did the other knee a year later, still during the pandemic. Yes. Um, and now that you are a veteran of knee surgery, did you have an easier time with the second one? Definitely easier time. And in what way? I, I found myself walking crooked with, before I got my second one done. And that led to back pain and everything else. And that was all alleviated once once I got my second week done. Great. And how about other activity? What else do you do besides work? I ride ATV, ride motorcycle. I I played volleyball recently. Are you back? I doing ride that? a lot of bicycle. <laughs> do you? Yeah. Are you back doing all that? Yeah. Great. Yeah. How about your weight? Did you knock any weight down since the surgery? A little, little bit. I, I go up and down. That's okay. Yeah. Good for you. But again, would you have any hesitancy in recommending our rapid recovery outpatient total knee replacement, even though uh, the pandemic is literally still going on? I recommend it to people all the time. Yes. Yeah. I recommend you and your team. Yeah, That's, we have a great team. We have Valley Healthcare Network. We have we have pathways and protocols, that sort of thing. So yeah. um, you did you did great. Um, gives you a new lease on life. Any regrets in doing it? Not at all. No? I would recommend it to anyone who has a problem with their knees. So great. Yeah. So I, I appreciate your feedback. Other patients will uh, will like what you had to say. So thanks so much, Joe. Okay, hey, thanks a lot. Mike. Great, you got yeah. it. So that was Joe, and, and, and Joe was great. It's hard to look in the crystal ball when a patient comes in and know exactly how they're going to do, but there's nothing more rewarding to change somebody's life. And, and Joe came in, and um, he's a contractor, and, and as we talked about in the injection part of this show, the injections weren't lasting three months. They would barely last six weeks, and, and Joe would just put up with it. So we would try not to inject him until three weeks. And so what was his alternative? His alternative was to take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And there's no free lunch. They have a, an adverse effect on your stomach. They can cause bleeding, ulcers. They can cause kidney problems. So ultimately, um, this was a remedy that cured him of future injections, anti-inflammatories. And it's great just to hear, their, to hear their stories. And again, he did participate in therapy. He had a therapy visit before, and he did therapy afterwards. So no formal therapy doesn't mean no exercise or no therapy. So he's a, he's a great example of, um, of a motivated patient that did his own therapy and required no narcotic analgesic medication. So um, I love the stories. We're going to have another show um, on my favorite video. So I want you to stay tuned for another show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time.